Good morning, everyone, and blessed Sabbath day. And for my uh, Japanese Okinawan friends, Ohio Gazaimas, Dozo Yoroshiko Nigeishimas. So it's good to be here. Well, today we are going to share the presentation on how to treasure your heart. So yesterday I shared uh, the fact that when I was a college student, I was asked to take care about 103 years old lady. So, and when, after washing dishes and helping her around the house, we were going through some pictures and I found this old black and white with old American Egan birth certificate. And it was dated 1898. 103 years old, so I finally asked her, would you tell me, please, the secret of the long life? I want to know. Would you like to know her secret? This is one of the treasure your heart nugget I brought it to you. You know what she told me? I've always been a slow learner, so God gave me time to learn. <laughs> so my heart was filled with joy because I told her I'm a slow learner too. I mean it because I was uh, 10 years older than average college student in my time. So, and uh, it took me almost seven years to graduate from college. So, I am a slow learner, so I have hope. So, and don't raise your hand if you're a slow learner. There is hope for you too. <laughs> <clears throat> so, health and relationships. That's something. We need to know. I would like to share another story. I never flown ever in the first business class in the airplane. But this story happened with a famous American actor, Telly Savalas. If you're in the 80s and watched movies in the past, so you probably know him. He is a Hollywood ce celebrity, famous for the Kojak TV series. So, and he was an uh, I heard this story at the camp meeting. He had an attitude, so he, he actually booked his first class for one reason he didn't want to talk to anyone, because people recognized he was a celebrity. But it happened to be he was not alone in that first class. So there was another gentleman, this one, who immediately recognized, Telly Savalas, I can't believe it. What an honor and privilege to fly with you. Can I shake your hand? And guess what? The Savalas just turned toward the window and looked in the window, ignored his request. So six hours later, he, he just told again, uh, Mr. Savalas, you know, I just want to tell you that my wife, my family, my children, everyone, we loved your TV show. We're all watching. And it's uh, such an honor and privilege uh, to, to be with you, and he just ignored, he just looked in the window again. At lunchtime, he finally told, Mr. Savalis, you know, I have two children, if I tell them that I was flying with you in an airplane, you know, they won't believe me, would you just sign this menu, give me your autograph, you know, that I can prove it to them. And he looked in the window again and ignored this request. So, and then a few minutes later, you know, they landed. It was 16 hours flight from Los Angeles to Athens, Athens, uh, capital uh, city of Greece. So, and the airplane pilot, he made an announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to ask your uh, patience because we will be delayed with the arrival procedure because we have a very important person on the board of airplane. So, and uh, as, as people of Greece and all the military and police and, and, and uh, dignitaries 
come and give him proper reception, please wait. And Terry Savalas thought, oh no, they know I'm coming. But at that moment, you know, this man, you know, he stood up and put his military outfit, you know, and, uh, and at the same time, the, the pilot continued. In fact, we have a king of Greece flying from the medical procedure from Los Angeles. So, and please wait until the people will meet the king. So, and then the next moment he went and it was his uh, moment and guess what the Tele Savales he confessed to the tabloid that I can't forget this incident for the lifetime so and then the next thing he he told so he says he, he, he that's what literally he, he his quote before he died to think the job, I was sitting for 16 hours next to the king. I could have personally acquainted with him, learned the names of the kids. I could have become friend of a king, but I was too much into myself. It hurts every single day. So, and in fact, the, you know, Tele Savales, he, he died from cancer. So, and that was the end of the story. And he confessed to the tabloids. And today we are talking about relationships. Excuse me. Just a moment. So, <clears throat> one Bible verse came to my mind. It was in the Hebrews 13:2. The God actually tells us not to neglect to be nice to the strangers, because by this we might entertain the angels. So, is it true? So, so naturally. If you want to be healthy and have a good relationships, be nice to strangers. You never know what can happen. But what if stranger doesn't look like a gentleman or a king? Inside of God, in the sight of God, he is still special and could belong to the royal family. Why we do these things like telesavales, miss opportunities, is because of sin. It runs in our DNA. It's natural to be irritated and, and to be in ourselves. And of course, sin breaks relationships, breaks families, and we know it. And here in Japan and Okinawa, I'm sure it's happening. So when we meet someone on our journey, of course, people have some luggage on their, on their shoulder. I never climbed Mount Fuji, but I live in Amori, and one day I decided to climb all the way Mount Iwaki, 1625 meters, 1,625 meters. So I tried to be as light as possible. So in our life, we don't want to be burdened with negative thinking, criticism, unforgiveness, because that will really slow down and, and not healthy. I just want you to imagine a perfectly healthy, good-looking athletic man or woman, you know, perfectly healthy. And the next thing you see, this person is screaming on their kids, kicking the dog and swearing and losing temper. We cannot consider this person healthy, right? So in uh, Matthew 39, 10-39, that he that finds his life shall lose it, and he shall lose his life for the sake, for my sake shall find it. Yeah, that, that's a profound verse about relationships. Also in Proverbs 25, 28, like a city whose walls are broken through a person who lacks self-control. So we need to have self-control. So in another Proverbs, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I would like to share right now the, the Harvard University, Robert Waldinger, you know, is shared so what, what makes us healthy and happy throughout the life? It was the longest research in the history of this Harvard University. So it uh, has ever been done. So it took 75 years and over 724 men was in, in the research. I was wondering, where are the women? Where are the women? <laughs> Why men? 
So anyway, so year after year, asking about their work, their home lives, their health, and of course asking all along the way, knowing how their life stories were going to turn out. And we know that some, some successful stories, some not. Some made it to the, be a president and CEO of the company, had good family, good kids. Some didn't live long and ended up not that glorious life. So what's the result of the research over 75 years? And we can share that a good relationship protects not only the health of the body, but also the brain. So yesterday we mentioned the, in the presentation, Treasure Your Body, how Akinavans has a little group of support, more I, so a little group. So if somebody is sick, they noticed and they come and visit. So and, uh, I recommend that we all have this kind of group and that's why church is about. So it says, and the research shows it is neither riches, no fame, not working makes a good and healthy life. That according to the research. The good relationships keep us happier and healthier. Period. That's a quote. So, and uh, today is the question is for you. I don't know how old are you now. Are you 25 or 40 or 60 years old? How about your relationships? So, and to go to the, back to the story about Telly Savales, who had a chance to spend 16 hours with the king of Greece and to get to know him, our God invited us every Sabbath to spend 24 hours with him and to get to know and guess what? I know from my personal experience, the closer you to God, the more personal relationship you have, other relationships are going better and, and successful. So I remember one man, young man shared with us, he says, I was perfect. You know, I was, had a good grades in college. I was healthy, good looking, spiritual, learning to be a theology, a pastor. I believed I was ready to be translated like Enoch to heaven until I got married. <laughs> <laughs> so I can also relate to this experience. So let us find time to build relationship with the king of the universe, the Lord of Lords. And one day, we will meet him in heaven and share relationships we built here on earth. Because one thing we can take, actually two things we can take to heaven with us. It's our character and people we made relationships and, and brought to Christ. Those things. So, if I, if I could chance to take a picture of you right now and put it on the screen. That will be your picture there. So because my prayer and hope that you won't be just healthy in body, healthy in heart, but you will have forever relationship with Jesus Christ. And someday we will enjoy the glorious second coming of Christ together. And I believe we could see him in our lifetime. Okay, and my wife is right now going to continue the presentation. So, Amen. Yes, uh, my husband and I, we came to Japan about three, three years ago uh, to do health evangelistic work. And we were in America for uh, close to 20 years or so. But uh, I... I believe that we have put a lot of emphasis on what goes in our mouth. And I, I know that that's very important. I worked at New Start 
uh, for two years, so <laughs> I've lived, breathed, and preached <laughs> New Start, and I'm sure many of you know what New Start is, nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, temperance, air, rest, and trust in God. But recently, in the past few years, I've been going back to the States and taking continuing education courses and being certified in various uh, areas, and I came across this quote, which I think is so profound, and it says that nine-tenths of all diseases begin in the mind. And this is from the book Mind, Character, Personality in um, uh, Ellen White's uh, series, Volume 1. And really, when you think about it, that's 90% of all diseases, of all heart disease, all cancers, all manner of uh, disease, 90% begin in the mind. So would it behoove us to understand why we need to keep our mind sharp, but not just our mind, but our hearts sharp with each other, our heart relationships with God. And this is not just something uh, within our faith. Dr. Dean Ornish, I don't know if you know him, but he's a world famous cardiologist that has advocated for uh, natural healthy lifestyles, uh, he's a secular man, does not believe in God. <laughs> but this is one of his quotes. It has said, uh, it, like I said, he's been featured on Newsweek, and, and, and many people have come to him to help overcome their heart disease. It has been said that there is no other factor, not diet, not smoking, not exercise, not stress, not genetics, not drugs, not surgery, that has a greater impact on our quality of life than what? Interpersonal relationships. Uh, I found that really to be key because we can have the best food, the best organic, high quality, <laughs> non-GMO, et cetera, et cetera, food, but if we are having this stressful argument with our coworker or a friend or our children, our parents, whoever it is, do you notice what happens in our body? <laughs> our blood pressure rises. We get this tension in our head. And I, I know I'm preaching to myself. You know, I know this happens to each and every one of us at some point in our lives where we, we have this stress that comes upon us. And the, the Bible shows so much on relationships. And it helps us to realize when we see the connection between relationships and disease, to know why the Bible talks about this. And here in Proverbs 18.21, it says, death and life are in the power of what? The tongue. And they that love it shall the fruit thereof. So in other words, there is the power in our tongue to promote death, which is disease, or to bring life. And it is quite the difference in health, wouldn't you agree? And here it is in Japanese as well. Uh, another quote that I found that was so profound, difficulties are often caused by gossip, whose whispered hints and suggestions actually poison unsuspecting minds and separate the closest of friends. So when we are tending to be critical, especially behind someone's back, we are poisoning people. Not just the person that we're talking about, but the person that we're talking to. And then again, we come back to this quote. Nine-tenths of all diseases begin in the mind. That's right. Now, I want just for a second to take a little exercise here. Everyone, take a look at this little cute little guy. Now, do not think of this guy. <laughs> do not look or think about a pink elephant. <laughs> now, what's going through our minds? <laughs> pink elephant. <laughs> There's just no way around it, right? We just automatically picture this pink elephant. Why is this? Well, Dr. Wa Daniel Wagner studied this social phenomena back in the 1987. And what our brain naturally wants to do is it thinks in pictures. And everything you put out there with your tongue will immediately send a picture into your mind. And 
this is automatic. This is just a one-step process. And if I can get this to go, oh yeah. A negative statement, however, when I say don't think of the pink elephant, that's considered a two-step process. We have to erase what we just said and then try to think of something else. And that negative statement actually creates uh, chaos in the brain, and it just doesn't work smooth to have that problem occur that you don't want to happen. So, for instance, you tell your child, don't touch the stove. And what does Johnny do? <laughs> because we put that image in their brain to touch the stove, touch the stove. So, what should we say instead? We need to avoid this negative expression. And what we can say is tell our brains what you want to happen. And you have to sometimes be a little creative, but I would suggest stay away from the stove. It's the same message, but what does the child put in her mind or his mind? A little image of staying away from the stove. But this doesn't just apply in a parent-child relationship, in a co-worker relationship, in any kind of relationships, even when you're trying to preach or teach. Whenever we say, well, don't go to the theater, don't do this, do that. Sometimes, not always, but that visual will stick in that person's mind and there's no way for them to replace it with what you want to happen. So that's just one little aspect of how we can encourage healthier relationships and watching what comes out of our mouth, uh, either behind their back. Uh, and what I have been praying is, Lord, please give me words to say that I would say if that person was always there and help me to uplift people. And if there is a criticism that has to be dealt with, Please, Lord, give me the strength to ask for prayer um, and pray out the criticism instead of just to have it out there to disseminate and, as counsel says, poison the mind. <laughs> so we have to learn to speak in affirming tones and present the proper pictures in our brains. Now, scientists have actually put four major emotions uh, into the categories, four key emotions. I know there's a whole range of them, but the, the four key ones we have are joy, and then the ones that we want to try to get out of, anger, fear, and sadness. And what our goal is to stay at this level of joy. There's also euphoria, but we can't live in euphoria. That That's just too overwhelming for the, the body. That's like when you fall in love and you have this endorphins just rushing through your mind, but uh, you kind of get so absent-minded that you can't think straight. Well, that's euphoria, and like I said, we can't live in euphoria forever, but joy is where we want to be, and then, of course, we have these other staircases of anger, fear, and sadness, but what scientists have known and studied in our brains is that fear and gratitude cannot coexist. So when we have an attitude of gratitude, all those other staircase emotions are pushed out of our minds. And that's why it's so important to have gratitude. And this afternoon we'll be going into a little bit more about uh, some activities and things about developing healthy relationships and treasuring our heart, and also in the connection between diseases and relationships. Um, I think you'll find a Fascinating, the newest research out on the brain, but also how our health is physically affected by how we think. You know, when we're talking about these last days, there's a lot of preppers <laughs> out there and people who are prepping for this or that. And I know there's whole clubs of uh, people who want to make sure they're um, in big, deep bunkers. Uh, when I lived in California, we were house, um, visiting a friend who was house-sitting, and this 
family, they were Adventists. They, they were prepping for the end. <laughs> they had a huge silo full of gasoline. <laughs> and they had underground tunnels built under their house um, for hideaways. And they had stored tons of food. Um, but this was back, they did it in the 80s, 70s, 80s. And by that time, all the gas, by the time we had um, been to the house, the gas had gone rancid and all the food had spoiled. And it was not what was Christ's intention when he has, uh, gave us these signs of the end. You know, when we talked about prepping, we have to realize that if we cannot truly be prepped relationally, how can Christ come to take us home? And so prepping is about uh, a deeper thing than just the physical. Um, we know that you know, the, the material things can be taken away in an instant. You know, just take a look at Venezuela. Um, the, there was a report at the GYC, which is the Generation Youth for Christ Congress in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and they showed these people in Venezuela go going to the markets. There's nothing in the market only bottled water and Coca-Cola, um, fish and meat and every other food supply is not there. The people in the city are eating zoo animals. They're going into the zoos and, and just taking whatever they can. And then people are in the hospitals can't get their medication. Uh, there's n <laughs> Surgeons are using the gloves over and over, the same syringes because there's no supplies coming into that country. And this is one of the richest countries in South America. It has the biggest oil supply. This shouldn't be this way. But because of the government and how things have gone down um, in corruption there, people have been dying. They have little child coffins. And what GYC has done, uh, Generation Youth for Christ, has trained people who are young professionals there in Venezuela to be medical missionaries. And they give them bags of grain and rice and to plant. And they've gone back out into the villages um, to help the village people to plant. And so they can survive and do natural remedies. Since there's no blood pressure medication, there's no other types of uh, things out in the stores. And I believe that's what God has in store for the whole world. And he's just showing us Venezuela right now. Uh, our friend David Gates, he used to have an avian aviation ministry there in that country, and he was telling us that the people in Caracas, yes, the cities, they were doing horribly. I mean, so many deaths, so many um, violence, so much mass protests. But those out in the country, in the surrounding areas, who have a few, few fruit trees and able to uh, live off the land, he said his Adventist friends and in the countryside are doing fine. So that's a lesson for us um, about prepping, but also prepping how are we going to be character-wise relationally able to relate. And I believe when it says here in Matthew 24, 14, the gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world, we know this, for a what? A witness. Now, what is a witness? It's what other people see how we are dealing with our family, dealing with our friends and our coworkers, our, our bosses, our, our whoever. <laughs> this is witnessing that goes to the end of the world. And the, then the end will come. And true prepping, I believe, we have to take the whole prep into our minds. So here we are. We're at the end of time. But... Uh, which line do we end up being in? There's the gratitude line, which is empty. And then there's the complaints line. And I know we just uh, got into the new year, but uh, November 23rd was Thanksgiving this past year. And this was always a time, for Americans at least, to give thanks and to recognize what the pilgrims went through um, sacrificing to have religious freedom and come to a free America to worship. Um, some lost their lives. 
and their families and children to disease and pestilence, but they did, the ones that survived were able to come and enjoy um, the Thanksgiving with the natives there that shared how to survive and how, and once the harvest was there, they gave thanks to the Lord for his bounties that they could uh, live and prosper there in America. And I believe we need to have Thanksgiving throughout the year. The top priority in healthful living, uh, it says there in Ministry of Healing, nothing tends to prom more to promote health of body and of soul than does a spirit of what? Gratitude, that's right, and praise. That's Ministry of Healing 251. Uh, when we are grateful, like I said, those other emotions won't be able to crowd in, those worries, those fears, those angers, those, those other types of things that want to pull us off the staircase of joy. What we think affects what? Who we are. Who we are is basically a witness, right? So it all ties together. And like I said, this afternoon, we will get into more of the disease and relationship connection. And I think you'll find this fascinating because most of the time, we've kind of separated out the physical part, mental part over here. And I was a physical therapist, and I was uh, always in the mindset of, if it isn't physical, it's not therapy. <laughs> but that's not necessarily true, because as I've been practicing for 20-some years, uh, you see how much the mind plays into pain, into suffering and disease. Uh, as it says in Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks in his heart, so is he. God has so much wisdom for us if we would go and understand it a little bit more, but not just understand it in our minds, but take it into our hearts. And like I said, we are preaching as much to ourselves as we are to each of you. And I just uh, appreciate this chance to share this message. Now I have a challenge for each of you, and it's a very simple challenge. It says, dwell on the good. And the first part of it is to avoid pessimism, which is not always easy to do because in our human nature wants us to get into the nitty-gritty and <laughs> analyze and eventually criticize. So avoid on pessimism and avoid anything critical about anyone or anything for 14 days, two weeks. <laughs> so... You can start, have a start date, and then mark it on your calendar there and see if we can have a 14-day period where nothing critical is said. But I know there, there are people that can fall off the wagon, so if that happens, <laughs> then you just restart on that day, and the 14 days will continue from that point on. So avoid pessimism, avoid anything critical about anyone or anything for 14 days. And once something critical is said, begin the 14-day process again. <laughs> now you think, that's almost impossible. <laughs> well, remember our uh, text for today? It's found in Proverbs 3, verse 5. And does anyone remember how it starts? <laughs> trust in the Lord. If we trust in the Lord, he will bring to mind all the remembrances, and he will help our understanding and learning our heart and learning how our heart can help our health. And I just pray, who would like to take this challenge? <laughs> Thank you. I know that the Lord will help each and every one that asks for it. And he has promised, if you trust with all your heart, uh, and lean on to our own understanding, he will direct our paths. Well, why don't we seal it with a prayer? If we could um, bow our heads and I will have a closing prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, today we have been so blessed with the service and the hearts of all of these people gathered. And we know that the Holy Spirit is among us because you promised where two or three are gathered, you will be amidst us. And we ask that in our heart, you know we want to be the best light and the best witness. And we know that every day that we get out and we are interacting with every person, that is a possible connection to bridge to you. And we would ask that you would fulfill this challenge in us to dwell on the good and to avoid the pessimism and avoid the criticism, but to help us to keep focused on how we can best make those connections and thereby treasure our hearts so that they will be purified and glorified when you come to take us home. Thank you, and we uh, ask and pray that those that aren't able to come, uh, that you would be with each of them as well and uh, bring those that need to hear the message uh, this afternoon and tomorrow so that they can spread this message of hope and your soon coming can come. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.